find the book of Revelation, last book of the Bible, chapter 22. It's a good place to be. Calvary Chapel, we say we go book by book, chapter by chapter, and verse by verse, and we have reached the last chapter of the Bible, chapter 22. Would you stand with us, please? Going to pray, and then we'll read our passage aloud. Our, our uh, message title this morning is The River of Life. Amen? River of Life. Father God, we are grateful to you for giving us the privilege of understanding your word because you, Holy Spirit, make it clear for us. And you lift up Jesus in our lives. And you give us insight, Lord, to your word. So we're grateful, Lord, to have the word in our hand, the word that you committed John to write down these things for us. And now we ask you, Holy Spirit, that you would make them alive in us. We ask you these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Chapter 22, verse 1, reading from the New King James Version of the Bible. God's word says this, And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the middle of its street and in the, on either side of the river was the tree of life, which bore twelve fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were for the healings of the nations. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. They shall see his face, and his name shall be on their foreheads. There shall be no night there. They need no lamp nor light of the sun, for the Lord gives them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. Church, you may be seated at this time. I feel like a doctor this morning that comes out of the operating room and all I have for you is nothing but good news. A good prognosis. This is your future. You're going to have water of life. It's going to be like rivers. It's going to be an amazing thing. And so it answers the question, as we were reading a few weeks ago, that in the new earth that God forms, this one's gone, on the new earth there was no more sea. And the surfer said, oh, bummer, man, Right? But today we get to talk about water. So it's not, we've been talking about uh, streets of gold, transparent, right? These uh, foundations of different stones, and you're thinking material, but where's the vegetables, right? So when we have water, it kind of softens it. It makes it more uh, inviting even for us. So God has certainly the perfect place for us. So we have come to this last chapter of the Bible we have been spending time in the future as the Apostle John, our eyewitness, was told to write these things down by the Lord Jesus, right? And so the things that he has seen, the things that he has heard, he has recorded them so that we understand and we can look forward to an exciting future that yet awaits us. Amen. So we're excited about that. Now some of the scenes that we've seen or heard from or read have been horrific. It's true. Some of them are horrible, but then some of them, especially in the last few chapters, they have just been glorious. We have also come to this last chapter to the end of God's written word. This is the last word of the Lord. That's why when people want to say, well, we have another Bible. Have you heard of this and have you heard of that? We say, no way, Jose. We have the written word from Genesis to Revelation, and that is it. And some uh, cults believe that there's fresh revelation, that there's uh, new news from God, but it's not the same God of the Bible. There you have different gods, and so you have to almost define terms with them. What God are you talking about? Because the God of our Bible says, this is it. There's the last book, and that we're going to end with an amen, which means so be it. But we have his last written word here in this chapter. And the last words are always important and they're significant and you think about this if grandpa's passing away grandma's passing away someone's passing away and they get to share last words with you you want to listen listen the last words are always important they're always significant and so is god's written word and we as humans we can write books some of us get to the point where we might write a bestseller if you may right but god's words found right here there's nothing like them there is nothing like these last words in the book of Revelation. We have come to the end of every godly person's journey. Anyone that's ever turned their life over to Jesus or in the past by faith uh, in God, whatever it's been, this is the end of the journey. It culminates in heaven. 
For us, we have learned much, and yet we do not have the full picture. As the Bible says, we still looking at uh, the future as we read it. Hearing the Word of God, it's like looking through a dark glass, the old Coke bottle or root beer bottle. You know, we're like looking through because we don't have the words to express or John's eyes to see what he saw. But we know that uh, when we arrive in heaven, we can personally ask God, hey, what did you mean about this? Hey, what about that that happened back in, you know, 2023 or 2024 or whatever? We'll be able to speak to God and Jesus about it. So church, friend, what I also want you to remember is this. We begin, we begin this last chapter, right? And we're going to see that God is still in control. But when we were back in Genesis 1, <laughs> in Genesis 1, verse 1, we read that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And so we've gone from page 1 of history that we know of and all the way to the last page of the Bible. And God is still in control. Doesn't matter what's happening in our world, our world continues to get dark, and we begin to get a little bit, uh, well, I don't want to say callous, but there was a mass shooting in Texas again yesterday at a mall, right? Another gunman, they had to kill him, this gunman. 20, 21 years ago, it was Columbine. We were shocked as a nation. How could this thing happen in the United States of America? But now, the world has become darker and darker and darker, and it's a time for you and I to let our light shine in the dark, right? Uh, and people look at us and they're mesmerized. How could we be so still looking about? How could we be so heavenly minded when all these things are going on on earth? Well, the Lord says, let your light so shine, especially during the dark times, right? It's we have a hope. If they ask us, what makes you so happy? How come you're so sure? Because we have the word of God with us. That's why we are. And so it's a good thing to know your word, to stand on your word. So we have one more peekaboo, right, of the inside of the new Jerusalem. And so with that, we are ready for the rest of the scripture, right? Look at verse 1. And he showed me, so it's John who is seeing this, and he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. Well, let's make some observations here. Number one, it's one of those seven angels, right, who had the seven bowls that in chapter 21, verse 9, they were pouring the bowls and the wrath of God was coming out. It's this one of those guys, it's this one who is giving now our eyewitness John a tour, a little tour, a little peekaboo inside of the new city. Second observation, John sees a pure river, clear as crystal, and the fountainhead or the headwaters originating from the throne of God and of the Lamb. So are you picturing that? I'm picturing a throne because we're used to thrones, right? And so one for God and one for Jesus, right? Where's the Holy Spirit? Ah, it's the first time we're not reading about the Holy Spirit. Have you noticed that the Holy Spirit has done his job? Do you remember when Jesus was going away, the disciples said, you can't leave us, and said, don't worry, I'm going to send another, another one like us, right? I'm going to send another. He will be a helper. He will help you. It is the Holy Spirit that convicted you and I of sin. It's the Holy Spirit that made Jesus so real to us, and we felt his conviction, right? It's the Holy Spirit that not only convicts us of sin, but he confirms to us that the word of God is the real deal, that Jesus is the real deal. Now we're there. We're in heaven. That's one of the questions you're going to probably ask him. Where's the Holy Spirit, right? It's certainly one that, that comes to mind that we can ask these things. So John, in his day, as we're talking about water, right, and any stream that comes to the ground, you and I know, especially if we've been looking at water right now, filling up our, 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 our ponds and water filling up our canals and things like that, it is ugly, brown, muddy water. Amen? Have you seen it? I know some of you guys uh, don't like to go into the river just because of the mud. You don't like the way it feels on your feet, right? And some of us are just concerned about parasites, the kind you can't see with the human eye. Well, you don't want that coming all over us, right? So, indeed, it's understandable that you don't want to go in rivers right now. We get that. But observe here with me that this river, this river that awaits us, this river is so pure, it's clear as crystal, is what the Word of God says. Thus it is called, it is called the river of life. Now, church, friends, 
this is significant because after getting an outside view of the New Jerusalem, again, one might come to the conclusion that it's all about the gold like we were talking about, those transparent streets and jewels, but not so. Here is pure crystal water. Water for life eternal. Water that doesn't have to be piped in. Water that you don't have to open up little bottles and pour plastic, right? Uh, it's not like that at all, you know. But Father God and Jesus, as they have taken care of the light build, right, because no more sun needed, the light comes from the Father, light comes from the Son, they have also taken care of the water. So really, if you think about this, all the utility bills are paid. Our Pentecostal friends would say, Hallelujah, right? But we're at Calvary Chapel, so we just say, Hallelujah. I get it. It's really good, you know. This is an amazing thing. How many of you guys got your tax assessments this week? Oh, oh they're going up. Not in heaven. That's why the Pentecostals say, and we say, hallelujah, right? Absolutely. This is going to be an amazing time. We are going to be able then, with the river of life flowing, we are going to be able to play, if you may, relax. We're going to be able to boat and enjoy this pure, crystal, literally healthy water in heaven. The great news uh, for you water lovers, it's just great news for you water lovers, and, and the answer to the question or the concerns that there is no more sea on the new earth. The sea right now, how many of you guys love the ocean? I mean, come on, you know you love the ocean, beaches and stuff. How many of you guys love to get a mouthful? Uh, oof. <laughs> right? A few of us need the salt. Maybe your, your throat is closing on you. You know, go get salt water. Right? <laughs> But no more. That salt, you know, was used to purify uh, and keep everything clean and those waters still looking blue for us, right? But did you know, did you know that way back in the day, uh, the psalmist even wrote about this, right? He wrote this. Um, there is a river whose stream shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacle of the Messiah. So King David writes this a thousand years before Jesus, right? And this year, another 2,000, uh, 23 years have passed. But God gave him a view. God shared with him so much, impressed his heart, that he wrote this. There is a river whose stream shall make glad the city of God. We are going to be in the city. We are going to be glad watching the water flow. Remember, there's no storm clouds. and It's not May like our May here. It may rain. It may not. It may snow. It may not. You might plant your flowers. You may not. Right till next week, Mother's Day, whatever. But listen. Listen, in the future, this river of life is going to flow, and you and I are going to be all around, and it's going to be awesome. Now, during the millennial kingdom, if you didn't know this, right, on earth, water will also flow from the temple where Jesus sets up his headquarters, and he reigns for a thousand years. We know this. We're talking about heaven right now, so that's after that time, but coming back to the thousand-year reign, that same river or a river also flowed. In fact, Ezekiel the prophet in chapter 47, verse 1, states this, or stated this, quote, Then he brought me back to the door of the temple, and there was water flowing from under the threshold of the temple toward the east, for the front of the temple faced east. The water was flowing from under the right side of the temple, south of the altar. Well, church, friends, the significance is that water, especially how fresh water was so rare during the tribulation period, but it was made available and in abundance when Jesus came back to rule the earth. In heaven, water is also made available. It is abundant, right? The Lord knows, I know he knows, that we love to play in water. We love to be refreshed by it. We love to be soothed by it, right? Even under a, like by a rock and the waterfall coming on us when it's nice and warm. You know, the water's never warm that's coming out of the mountains, but uh, it is an amazing time. We play in it, we're refreshed by it, we're soothed by it, and we even enjoy our jacuzzis in the water. It is amazing. But most of all, he knows that you and I like to drink water, right? Pure crystal water. And so he will provide it in abundance in heaven. I don't, I, it's, there it is, water. Interesting that man, while on earth, he searched for the fountain of youth. Do you remember being in grade school and we talked about Ponce de Leon, right? 
coming out of uh, Europe somewhere, and he came to Florida as an explorer. And that's where he began, if you read the history books before they change him again, he began to look for the fountain of youth. But here in heaven, we have water, pure water, that's going to keep us throughout eternity. It's a great, great future for us. All right. It says here that uh, in the millennium then and now in heaven, verse 1, a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. So Father God and Jesus the Son make it available for all of us throughout eternity. That's going to be amazing. Verse 2, look at your Bible. In the middle of its street and, another so and on either side of the river was the tree of life which bore 12 fruits each tree yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. A couple of things to observe here, right? Number one, it talks about the tree being on each side, the tree of life. But then it says trees, plural, having its fruit. So can this tree of life be like when you're in Hawaii, we see the banyan tree. The banyan tree is one that has roots here. And then before you know, it, you're like walking under a tunnel and this root you know, where did this tree go? And then other trees come out of it. I don't know. Can it be like it? Maybe so, because it said the tree of life. And then if you note it right here in your verse, trees yielding fruit uh, every month. So the leaves of the tree were for the healings of the nation. We'll talk about that in just a second. Church, friends, not only is there going to be an abundance of pure, crystal clear water that gives you and me joy and life, and refreshment, but observe, number one, the street of the city, which was pure gold, like transparent glass, that we learned from 21 verse 20, chapter 21, verse 21, is pretty wide street, for this river of life flows in the middle of its street. In the middle of its street? How wide is that? I'm looking at this aisle right here, maybe 8 feet to 10 feet wide, uh, but there's no river flowing through it. Right? If the streets in heaven are wide and they go how far? 1,500 miles. We talked about that, right? Not only this way, that way, that way, this way. We took those measurements, right? It's like a cube. This is a big street. And what we're reading here is in the middle of its street. So now we have a, what you and I would call a divided street. I don't think it's like the one ways in Denver yet, right? Or Los Angeles or San Francisco, especially. Have you ever been up there? But it's, 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 it's different. I don't know how different. Not there yet, but we're looking at things. But what I'm thinking is this. Fresh water by the street, time for an inner tube ride. Even if it's 1,500 miles on fresh water. You know, I'm going to get on that. You know, first couple hundred years, we're going to be praising the Lord, worshiping Jesus. Maybe in the next 500 years, I'm going to take this little tube thing and just, you know, float. I mean, it's, it's 1,500 miles is a big trip. I mean, and it's going, so this is going to be an amazing thing. Second observation is that on either side of the river was the tree of life, which bore 12 fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month. A church friend, we were first introduced to the tree of life back in the Garden of Eden, right? Eden was a paradise, a garden of trees among which two trees were mentioned. The tree of knowledge of good and evil, that was number one. And secondly, the tree of life. The tree of life is a fruit tree. A fruit tree. It produces 12 kinds of fruits every month. This fruit tree that we're reading about, this tree of life, will produce plenty to eat. It's not for landscape, although I think, as a guy that loves landscape, it has to be the most beautiful tree ever, Right? But the, but the bottom line, the fruit of the tree of life is for eating. Now, how many of you, know, how many of you guys know this, that you can eat in heaven? I mean, I, I know it's kind of like, come on, man, are they going to have Burger Kings and all this stuff? No, I, I don't think it's going to be that way at all. But let's answer the question. Let's start again and answer the question that most Christians, being a young Christian, just came to the Lord, or an older Christian, you know, with the Lord, uh, we always ask, will we eat in heaven? And the answer is, absolutely so and how do we know that well you remember jesus appearing you know after uh his resurrection and and that night in the room where they were at 
uh, he appears and they're freaking out. They're thinking he's a ghost at first. And he says, come on, you know, you can see, you know, ghosts don't have bones and, and, and this and that. And Jesus is, is talking to them. And then he finally asks them the famous Christian question, right? The famous Christian question is this. Do you have anything to eat? <laughs> and they, they're looking at him and say, yeah, we got some broiled fish here. And what did Jesus do? Oh, I can't eat that because we're in it. No, no. He ate the fish with his new body. And they even brought him some, like, honeycomb and stuff like that to, you know, wash it down or whatever. But they, they gave him food, so he ate. So we know as a deduction from Scripture as we look at it, yes, with our new bodies we'll be able to eat, and certainly we're going to be able to drink. And so we're looking forward to all that. So, yes, pure crystal water and 12 kinds of fruit each month, each month that we could mix and match every which way, right? We do not have restaurants today that offer you four kinds of fruit. I don't know if you've ever gone to a restaurant, any restaurant, right, and ask them, what kind of fruits do you have today? They'll never give you more than four. Not here in the United States. Other countries might, but not here, you know. And if you ins insist on a fruit that's not of the season, they might thaw it out and then bring it to you as something frozen that they had to nuke in the microwave so you can have that fruit, but not in heaven. Twelve different types in heaven, 12 varieties of fresh fruit each month, then the next month. Heaven is God's paradise, as we know. And once more, water, trees, and fruit in abundance to eat is all around us in that new city. And by the way, for you carnivores, eat well today after church. Eat well, you know, go to your favorite place. Just have this little thing in the back of your mind with the doctors say, too much red meat is not good for you. We're going to get new bodies, so you might as well stuff it if you want to or do whatever you can with the red meat today, you know, while you have that opportunity. Last time I talked about this, guys told me, Ben, I just had to go get a steak after church. You know, it's just, you know, it's not going to be in heaven. Well, it might not be in heaven. Listen, do you remember back in the Garden of Eden? How many of you guys remember reading about the Garden of Eden? All fruit trees and everything else like that. Adam and Eve did not eat Bambi's parents. Right? They never ate the meat in the Garden of Eden. And so in this new place, this new place called heaven, probably not going to be eating uh, meat. I, I don't think God's going to have all the precious animals. I think God's going to have animals in heaven, by the way. I mean, we know there's horses. Amen? You know, who knows? If Trigger, Flicka, or whatever your favorite pets are there, I'm not going to go there with you, but we know that there's going to be animals in heaven. All right. So we come to our third observation here, and still in verse 2, and that's this. The leaves of the tree were for the healings of the nations. All right, Bible students, put your thinking caps on. Because we just mentioned something that kind of should, kind of, but I thought, but I thought, but I thought, right? So the leaves of the tree were for the healings of the nations. So the nations are the nations that were referred to in our last chapter, chapter 21, verse 24. It said this, quote, And the nations of those who are saved shall walk in its light. Talking about the New Jerusalem's light. And the kings of the earth bring their glory and honor unto it or into it, right? So remember, the nations are not the bride of Christ. They are not you and I, the church, ever since Jesus' day. It's the nations that came to God before us in faith. You know, you have Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You have that whole line. Joshua, you have Moses, you got King David. You have the prophets. That's part of the nations. But you, and that's just the, the Jewish part of it. It's his story. It's always his story. H-I-S-T-O-R-Y. His story if that follows. But there were other nations that gave their lives to the Lord. And then the tribulation period came. And in the tribulation, they're not the church either. These guys get martyred for their faith in Christ. But they're from all over different nations as well. So they come and it says, and the kings of the earth bring their glory into it. So they're not the bride. They are saved while well, they, can, they can visit the new city, right? But the key was they will not dwell how we dwell in heaven. There's this, that's why the new earth is here for them. And that's chapter 21, verse 21. So church, friend, now that we know what the nations, the angel is referring to, let's ask the next question, right? And that is this. Why do they have to be healed? Why do they have to be healed? For we learned that in heaven there is no more sickness. For the former things have passed away, as we learned in chapter 21, verse 4. So 
I have a couple of considerations for you to think about. I'm not being dogmatic about it. You're probably smarter than I am in these things, but I'm just going to share with you what comes out through study and, and, and talking with other people about this, right? So two considerations for you to what, quote, the leaves of the tree were for the healings of the nations, what it means. Number one, the word healing. You and I immediately think someone's sick if you're going to be healed. That's how we use it. But the word healing is literally in a Greek, therapia, right? Or therapia, something like that in Greek, right? From which we get our word therapy. Does it not sound like that? Absolutely. And what's therapy for? To cure you or to prevent you from messing up your back? You go to therapy to start healing a sore bone or sore muscles. We, we understand that a little bit. It's for prevention. They tell us old guys, if you're going to golf, you better stretch before you golf. There's nothing worse than seeing a guy over 55 or 50 get up there, right, looking and see where he's going. Where am I going? Just go straight, dude. Okay, right? Then he takes the club and he does one of these. Oh, there goes the rib cage, this and that, and your arms. They tell you always stretch. It's good therapy to stretch. And then if you're not, if you're going to plant your gardens coming up beginning next week, Learn to stretch, or you'll be like me after, cramp, 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 you know, on your legs because you're not used to doing all this work, right? I scared my grandkids to death almost, uh, I think it was last year or the year before, I forget when it was. I had just finished planting all day, and they come over in the evening, we're going to use the jacuzzi, we're going to do something, I forget what it was. And uh, I'm, I'm right there with them, and all of a sudden, I get this leg cramp. Oh, my goodness. I could not move. So I tell Judy, uh, as I usually call my wife, hey, right, or something like that real loud, right? And, and here can, the kids are just like this. Oh, Grandpa's dying. He's having a heart attack. I'm trying to reach my legs. I'm going down, right? I'm telling you, you stretch before you start doing this in your garden. You know, it's going to kill you if you don't. Okay, you'll remember this if you don't stretch. But these are the things. So anyway, we're talking about this. It doesn't mean healing. It doesn't mean healing from sickness, but rather a more of a maintaining of health. So most of us are familiar with the old saying that an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, right? Well, it may be, and again, I'm not certain, I don't want to be dogmatic on this, you know, but that after a thousand years of water rafting, they came up to the New Jerusalem, you know, or jet skiing, right, on that pure crystal waters, a river of life, uh, eating lots of fruit from the tree of life, that they might have to be revived eternally, you know, revived eternally by the leaves of the tree of life. They're eating the leaves of the tree. You cannot ignore this part of scripture. It's right here. So we have to address it, right? So that's one thought. A second thought, you know, uh, theologians, and, and you can get them from Denver Seminary, Dallas, you know, Fuller, uh, all the seminaries around, uh, they believe that there is a possibility, again, so no one's being dogmatic about it because we're not there, but there might be, there's a possibility that the new earth dwellers, right, they're not the church, we're not, we're not talking about us, the church, right, we're the bride of Christ. Remember, where Jesus is, we're with him, right, the bride of Christ. But they, the new earth dwellers, uh, save Jews, save Gentiles, there is a possibility that their bodies are not exactly like our bodies. Hmm, the bride. We dwell in a new city. They come up to worship, fellowship, bring their glory and their honor to it, but perhaps they also come to be renewed physically via the leaves of the tree of life. Now, I don't want to make a, a total comparison like this, but i got to ask you guys this. How many guys, how many of you recharge your cell phone every night? Half of you. The rest of you, I don't want to say this. I don't want to say that you're, I don't want to say this, but I'll ask you again. How many of you guys recharge your cell phones? Yeah, more hands went up. Most of us do. Our, our bodies or their bodies, the ones that dwell in the land, they're not the bride. They're honored. They accepted God. But you have a privileged place. You are the bride of Christ. You belong to Jesus all the time. He gave his life for us, right? And so we've come to him by faith. Uh, we're a little bit different than Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. In fact, I've shared with you many times before. You know today more than King David, Isaiah, 
uh, uh, Solomon and all these guys in the past, you know more because we have the full counsel of God. We know more of the things pertaining to God than they did. So they are a little bit different. So who knows if, if this might be true that their bodies, again, the theologians think maybe there's a possibility uh, that they just might need to be renewed physically after spending you know, a few hundred years, thousand years, or whatever we call time because it's out of time and need to be, uh, have a leaf of the tree. When we first came, my family first came to the Western Slope, most of you know, we grew up in Los Angeles, Judy and I, and then we lived our last years in San Diego. And um, for the very first time in my life, I was in Delta working for the Delta Police Department there, and I'm talking to this fellow, and as I'm talking to him, this cowboy guy, and they really had cowboys here, you know, it's just amazing, right? This cowboy type guy, he's talking to me, and he's chewing on a piece of straw. Now, I've seen that before. I've seen John Wayne on TV. I, I've seen uh, all these guys on TV, but I've never seen somebody just chew on straw like we chew on toothpick or something. I, I don't know. It just, it was different for me. I, you know, I went home, and I got a blade of grass, not the other bad kind of grass, right, but the, a blade of regular grass. I just, if he could do that, I'll probably do it, and I put it in my mouth. <laughs> Nasty stuff. You know, but it's possible it's possible that we'll nibble on these leaves. You know, I never thought about that. I, when I get a fruit from the tree like you, right, I don't need a peach leaf with my tree, but some of you guys drink it in your tea. I've seen you. Right? I have leafy teas and stuff like that. I don't know, but it's kind of interesting, huh, that it's there. And it's for the healing of the nations. So we're not talking about the bride. So make a difference. When you talk about this, take a look at this. When you go home and study it personally, take a look at this. Consider these things that are possibilities. All right. So, verse 3. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and His servants shall serve Him. So this is amazing because we know, church, friend, that the first creation in the old earth was devastated by the curse of sin. In fact, today we still are feeling and living in hard times. And as our world continues to insult God and turn against Him, life on this earth is becoming harder. As I said uh, before, this massacre that happened yesterday in Dallas, not Dallas, but Texas, where a man goes into the mall and he shoots all these people. They, they got the, the shooter and they killed him as well. Uh, most of us didn't even hear the news and most of us like, oh, glad we don't live in Texas. But 20, 21 years ago, when it happened at Columbine, the nation was shocked that these two fellows or more, you know, went in and shot up all these kids at Columbine High School, right? Our nation was shocked. And we said, how could this happen in the United States? But it happened. 20, umpteen years later, oh, wow, another massacre. Do you hear? Yeah, pass the salt, you know, pass the ketchup. You know, it's nothing to us anymore. Our nation... Our world is spinning quickly out of control. And, that, and know this, our nation, the people overall, it's an insult to God. The Lord says, as it was in the times of Noah, so it shall be. Or in the times of Sodom and Gomorrah, so it shall be. The latter days, you know, when sin is blatant in your face, you know that the nation has turned for worse. And that's where we're at right now. Therefore, you let your light so shine in the dark times. Meaning that when people ask you, well, you don't seem so concerned. I says, well, I know where I'm going. <laughs> you want to talk about a river in the future? You know, we know. We know these things. And they look at us, and we do talk to them. And at first, it might be tough for you to, to evangelize, to talk to someone else. The buzzword is called evangelize, to share with someone else about Jesus. But it shouldn't be so odd for you. And if you feel, I, I feel so, so strange talking to someone about Jesus. Well, it's like you're stroking the cat, and the cat's like, yeah, right? Turn the cat around. Do it the other way, right? And, and so now find a common subject. Find something that you can talk about and share with them about the Lord. Dude, water, man. We're going to have, you know, what, whatever. God can give you words and help you share. And, and it's no coincidence that you are there. We all call them divine appointments, right? And, and they are. God knows who you have you share with. And you don't know what God's been doing in that person's heart. Probably, gosh, I like to talk about water, but how am I going to bring that up? And then you bring up the river of life. Is this a God sent or what? You know, you just never know how the Lord can use that. So we have good news because in this new world, in this new creation, in this new paradise, 
there is no more devil. There's no one there to mess with the minds and the hearts and trick, trick uh, on Adam or Eve. He is gone from the scene. So this is good news, news, church. There's no one to whisper the lies. God and Jesus, the Lamb, live among us. And they will never, ever be absent, Right? Again, this is good news for us. Sometimes we think about something could be real good. Yeah, it was good in the Garden of Eden. It was great. And then the devil sneaked in. Yeah, you have reason to think that, but it's not going to be in the future. He's gone. He's out of the picture forever. Also, that his servants shall serve him. This is interesting because it implies that heaven is a place where there is a lot of interesting things to do. A lot of action going on in heaven. Great action. Just think, if God created more galaxies, you know, if he just did different things like that, he may give us the opportunity to manage them, to do this and that with them. You never know. Think about this church. When God created the Garden of Eden, he put Adam there to name the animals, and then he gave him a job. Dude, how about being a gardener in here? Oh, absolutely. This is an awesome job. Well, why can't he do likewise, maybe not the garden, some of you might want the garden, right? But why wouldn't he do likewise? Perhaps you know, something more compelling for us. We know this. With God, all things are possible. In doing some research and going to, you know, talking to, about Bible commentators and this and that, I came across a statement that John Corson, Pastor John Corson, up at the Applegate Christian Fellowship in Oregon, Southern Oregon, he's a commentator as well, and John Corson states this about this verse, quote, The interest and inclinations that the Lord built into each of us will at last be fully utilized in heaven. We're free, we're free from, we're, we're, we're free from time limitations or financial obligations. We'll use them to serve the Lord. Ours will not be the service of one who drags into work at the last minute, dreading the day ahead. No, ours will be the service of one who says, oh boy, that is what I always wanted to do. This is something I always wanted to do, end quote. And now we could do it for the Lord. God made you. You're going to be different, yes, holy, yes. But you know what? God made you. There are some of you guys that love to garden. There are some of you guys that I go to their yards and, oh, my word, how did you? Well, you know, I put these together and I got these things called flower beds. I never saw flower beds raised from the ground like that, like I see in some of your yards. But there's all kinds of things to do. Some of you guys are crafty doing this and that and other things. Some of you guys are flat-out great builders. And people that are creative, right? Could you imagine what the Lord's going to do? How about those, those of, I can't say just you ladies, because I've seen Rosie uh, Greer do this one time, but he was knitting. You guys don't know who Rosie Greer was, a football hero during my times, Los Angeles Rams, fearsome, foursome, but we won't go there. But uh, like my mother-in-law, she makes blankets and she makes all this kind of stuff. Still at 99 years old and she has too much yarn. But the, the point is that, that we're creative, we can do some things, and now without time limitations, without finances, as John says, being uh, there for us, who knows what we could do in service for him. 1,500 miles like a cube is a lot of stuff to do in there, and that's just there. You know, there's still the earth. There's still the, that new earth. It's going to be an amazing time for us. Man, I, I can hardly wait. Looking forward to it. All right. So I think there's going to be a line, probably of volunteers, the ones who serve the Lord. Lord, my turn. I just spent 20,000 years over here. I'd like to come and do something for you. Verse 4. They shall see his face, and his name shall be on their foreheads. Interesting, because Moses in the Old Testament, Philip in the New Testament, they wanted to see the face of God in heaven. We'll finally be able to see them both face to face. You know, each one of us, is going to be like him, like our Lord Jesus. We will not be them, don't misunderstand them, right? But like them, in that we have taken on their character. It'll be a perfect resemblance. As we used to say, dude, we're going to be family. We're family already. Could you imagine? It's going to be incredible. Last verse, verse 5. There shall be no night there. They need no lamp nor light of the sun, for the Lord God gives them light and they shall reign forever and ever. Church, as we close, Sarah, our uh, worship team can come up. Prayer team, uh, please come on up as well. But as we conclude, again, there will be no need 
for light uh, as a source of, uh, the sun won't be the source of light or the moon, right? They serve us today for God, and we're glad for that, but not then. God and the sun, S-O-N, will be the light source forever and ever more. Aren't you glad about that? That's going to be a, a phenomenal. Our stay in heaven also is not for a hundred years, not for a thousand years. Our stay in heaven is forever and ever and ever. It's going to be for eternity. It's going to be phenomenal. And it says, we shall reign, states this verse, forever and ever. So I trust that you have asked Jesus for a one-way ticket to heaven. I don't think anybody wants to, wants to come back. There's nothing to come back to anyway, right? But I pray that you have, that you've asked him, you recognize them, you heard the gospel. God so loved the world. That he didn't want anyone to be lost. But that all who would believe in him, that he would give them eternal life. God will forgive your sin. Amen. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Right? No one comes to the Father except through me. And so whether you're listening on radio or you're watching on our live stream, if you haven't made your commitment to the Lord, you should. You've heard the gospel before. It's time to invite Jesus to come into your heart. Right? Take that step of faith. Ask him to forgive you of your sins. Ask him to write your name in the Lamb's Book of Life so that you could be part of heaven. This first part of our last chapter, a river of life is going to be about us. It's going to blow us out of the water. No, I don't want to say that. Well, hopefully help us jump in the water or something, right? It's going to be a perfect time. I pray that you won't miss him. Father God, you're so good to us to... Have John write these things down. John must have been just so excited. Oh, what a time of blessing he spent with you in the spirit, away from the island of Patmos, Lord, to write these things. And you're giving him peekaboos of heaven. And he wrote it down to share it with us. We are so glad, Lord. We have expectations in our heart. We can hardly wait. We say Maranatha. Come, Lord Jesus, come quickly for us and take us home. But Lord, if it's your will that we stay yet another year or another hundred years, may we be lights that shine for you. May we be like you and share the word. We pray for the sick and encourage those who are downhearted, Lord. May we be the ones, Lord, that imitate you while you were on earth, Lord. And may we do all this for your honor and your glory, Lord. For your name's sake, let us live the lives that please you, Lord, and lives that are attractive to others who are in the dark and have no hope for tomorrow. Lord, if there's anyone here that have not surrendered their lives to you, Lord, may they do so now. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand, church?